Good morning, and thank you to each of you who participated in Trunk Retreat in, in one way or another. Um, that last Sunday morning, we were worried we weren't going to have enough candy. The Lord multiplied the candy. We had more candy than we knew what to do with. Uh, so we're very, very grateful for that. Great event. So the, those of you who are trying to figure out who I am, it's because I shaved um, for that event. And it was really fun because about 95% of people that I spoke to had no idea who I was. Like, zero idea. I had a 10-second conversation with Fleming Johnson, who's our elder chair, before he realized who I was. <laughs> so, anyway, I don't know if that's, the costume was that good, or Fleming's just, uh, I don't know what's going on. So, <laughs> well, I want to invite you guys to turn to Luke chapter 10. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open your word, I, I ask that you would, your voice would be the loudest voice in the room this morning. Louder than the voices in our heads, louder than um, the anxieties we've carried into this space, louder than whatever we're processing right now in this moment, that you would speak to us through the preaching of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night that the Titanic struck an iceberg on her ill-fated maiden voyage, it should be noted that initially not everyone was aware of the direness of the situation. On the top decks where the rich folk were, they were dancing and singing and eating all of this opulent, luxurious food. They were tragically oblivious to what was happening beneath them. Everything looked normal. Um, not only normal, but everything looked fantastic. They were having the time of their lives. But on the lower level, where an iceberg had punched a, um, had punctured the hull of the ship, was a very, very different story. And soon enough, the issues below on the Titanic, with the water coming into the boat, soon enough those issues began to rise to the upper decks, dooming the ship, her crew, and her passengers. Now, Pastor Rich Villadas, who's a pastor in New York City, reminds us of the power of this metaphor, and that is this, that sooner or later, the issues on the lower deck of your life are going to rise to the surface. Sooner or later, the issues on the lower deck of your life are going to rise to the surface, no matter what kind of image you're projecting to people today, what kind of image you project on social media, no matter how you are carrying yourself, telling yourself and the world that you are doing well, whatever is happening in your heart, whatever is happening on the lower decks is eventually going to surface, whether that's good or that is bad. And in truth, when we think about our spiritual lives, what is most important in our life is what's happening on the lower decks. That's where spiritual formation actually happens. Pastor Rich Villadas again asked this question. It's an important question. It's on the screen. How are you and I to experience wholeness in our own personal lives while being instruments of healing in a world that is breaking apart around us? Many of us are here. We want wholeness. We want to experience the fullness of Christ. We want to have a life that's impactful on those who are around us. How are we to experience that? He said this, to start, we must live in a different place. We have to go down to the lower decks. I alluded to this last week when I talked about emotionally healthy spirituality, but that's what Pastor Rich is talking about. Our spiritual formation ultimately happens on the lower deck of our life. But what's so interesting is, is that we tend to assess our wellness, our spiritual wellness, in terms of our accomplishments, in terms of our intellectual acumen, in terms of our possessions, in terms of our gifts, in terms of our circumstances. That's where most of us tend to assess how well, how well we are doing spiritually. And not only do we assess ourselves this way, most of us leverage those externals. We leverage our intellect, our giftedness, our possessions, our accomplishments. We leverage them for the sake of the gospel and find ourselves believing that that is the indicator of how we're doing in our relationship with God. In other words... Many of us spend more time focused on what we're doing for the sake of Jesus than actually spending time with Jesus. 
And not only are we doing, but we're preoccupied with the doing. Maybe not even preoccupied with the doing. We're actually tyrannized by a life of doing. We do so much, even for the sake of Jesus, that we lose sight of that which is necessary. We enter into dangerous waters when we neglect the lower decks of our life. When we don't evaluate our motivations for our religious living, and when we don't do that evaluation, we jeopardize the fruitfulness of all that we are doing for God. Our big idea this morning is around that idea. It's this, that a purposeful life, as we continue our series, Life on Purpose, a purposeful life prioritizes abiding in the presence of Jesus over ministry to Jesus and for Jesus. A purposeful life prioritizes abiding in the presence of Jesus over ministry to and for Jesus. I get this from the story in Luke chapter 10. I'm going to read a couple of verses, make some comments. Read a couple more verses and make some comments. Let's pick up on verse 38. It says, Now as Jesus and the disciples went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. This is an interesting story, in part because this event is only recorded in Luke's gospel. It's a very simple lesson in a very simple setting. Jesus and the disciples enter a village. We know through... um, Scripture that that village is Bethany. We know that Martha has a brother and a sister. The brother's not mentioned. You might know his name, Lazarus. The sister is mentioned, Mary, and Mary is a silent figure in this story, but she's very important. And the first thing that we notice is Mary's very unusual position. We're told that Mary is seated at the feet of Jesus, listening to his teaching like a disciple would. Not only is she seated at his feet, but the actual original language suggests that she had intentionally taken initiative to place herself beside Jesus. Now, for those of us in our egalitarian world, that world just basically means that we live in a world where, for the most part, we think men and women are equal. This is kind of lost on us, that she would go and position herself by Jesus. But culturally, what she's doing is a no-no. Women did not study at the feet of rabbis. As a matter of fact, culturally in Jesus' world, for the most part, men would have said women are good for preparing meals and birthing sons. I don't say that to be condescending. That's just the reality of the situation. As a matter of fact, the Mishnah, which was a collection of rabbinic teachings around Jesus' day, here's one statement about how men and women would relate in a teaching setting. It says, He that talk much to womankind brings evil upon himself and neglects the study of the law and at last will inherit Gehenna. Gehenna is hell, by the way. So you get what the rabbinic teaching says? For a man to spend time talking to and teaching a woman, he's wasting his time and he's on the road to hell. Pretty harsh assessment. So Mary is out of place, right? And she's out of place not only in the eyes of culture, but she is, as we're about to find out, she's out of place in the eyes of her sister, Now, here's what I want you to notice. She's not just hearing Jesus teach. We're told that she is listening to Jesus. Do you remember the Shema from last week? This prayer, this ritualistic prayer the Jews would pray. And it was around, the the whole idea behind it was that they would learn to, in this rhythm of prayer, they would learn to listen to Jesus and love Jesus. The idea of listening here is more than just hearing the voice of Jesus in the same way. Some of you may be listening to what I'm saying and some of you may not be listening to what I'm saying. Some of you may have already set a countdown mode and you can't wait to get done so you can get to lunch. She's not just listening to Jesus. She is contemplating his word. She is paying attention to. She is desiring to live a whole life. And what I mean by that is she wants to listen to Jesus in a way that not only transforms her outward actions, but she wants to be a whole person. She wants integration. She wants lower deck health. I wonder, 
Have you had these moments in your own journey with Jesus where you're just frustrated by the disconnect in your life between your outer life, which looks so good, nice and shiny and polished, and your heart motivations, which sometimes seem so far from God? Listening, integration is meant to bring alignment between those two things. Transformation, that's what Mary is after. She is listening to Jesus, but bigger than that, she is communing with Jesus. Listening and communing. The, communing. These are the postures of an emotionally healthy disciple. And all of it just brings us to this place of understanding that, that a very key element in discipleship is attentiveness to Jesus. Now, that seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? You're like, well, I mean, you're a genius, Pastor Aaron. Like the, the key to following Jesus is to pay attention to him. Well, here's the thing. Whether you're married or you have a roommate when you're in college or you've had a roommate before, or you've had siblings, have you ever noticed how easy it is in life to, to be in the presence of someone and pay them no attention whatsoever? That you're having conversations, but they're not intimate conversations. You're sharing meals, you might be sharing a bed, you're sharing tasks, but there's no attentiveness nurturing the relationship. You know what I'm talking about? Mary is nurturing that attentiveness. This is a key element in our own relationship with God because fundamentally, um, we are meant to get our identity, who we are, from our vertical relationship with God revealed to us in Jesus. If we want to know what God is like, we look at Jesus. I'm meant to, you're meant to have identity through that vertical relationship. We discover who we truly are as we are attentive to Jesus, as we commune with Jesus. We discover that we are not what we produce but that we are sons of God, daughters of God, loved by Him, chosen, holy, made holy by His work, not our own works. And everything we do for the gospel is meant to be birthed out of that identity, who I am. I am not what I do. I am who I am in Christ. But as we're about to see, identity is a place of both temptation and battle. For all of us. Identity is a place of spiritual temptation and battle. We are, we are tempted, as Paul David Tripp said, we are tempted on, on, almost every day to make an identity exchange. What is the identity exchange? It is this subtle shift in our priorities revealing that we find our sense of worth in something other than Jesus. The exchange, don't miss this, is the subtle shift in our priorities revealing that we find our sense of meaning in something other than Christ. I've shared this story before, so I won't get into all the details, but one of the reasons for me that I chose not to pursue playing soccer in college is because it was already very clear to me that my priorities were soccer, not Jesus. And Jesus had interrupted my life in such a way that I knew that the temptation to try to serve two masters, which Jesus says is impossible, would be too great. And so the wise choice for me was to say no to something I love in order to say yes to something that I loved more. Or at least was learning to love more. That was a difficult choice. But it was so that I might avoid that subtle shift in priorities, which is the identity exchange. Mary reveals that she understands that what matters most is attentiveness to Jesus. What's Martha doing at this time? Well, look at verse 40. It says, Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to Jesus and said to Jesus, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Now, before we're too difficult, before we're too hard on Martha, just keep a couple of things in mind. First and foremost, think about how many mouths to feed Jesus probably brought with him. If you could imagine going home today and, and having a few things in your cupboard, and then all of a sudden me and 12 people show up and say, we're hungry. You might be a little overwhelmed in that moment. Maybe, depending on when the last time you went to the grocery store. Even if you went to the grocery store recently, you probably still would be a little overwhelmed, right? She is desperately trying to be a good host. As a matter of fact, everything that she is doing 
is exactly the thing that Jesus says to look for in chapter 10, verse 8. In chapter 10, verse 8, when he sends out the 72, he says, when you find a hospitable person welcoming you into their home, that is a sign they are open to the gospel. So Martha's doing the very thing that Jesus tells people to look for, right? But in her doing, there are some warning signs that the, 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 the activity on the lower deck is not healthy. We see three of them. One is that she is distracted. It says that she is distracted with much serving. She's being pulled away from something important, attentiveness to Jesus, towards something of lesser importance. She is busy. She's hurried. She's unfocused. She's overburdened with an affair. She's distracted. Distraction is one of those signs. It's a warning light on the dashboard that things aren't Good for us spiritually. I wonder, in your own life, what are the things in your life that keep you distracted? Which is another way to say, what are the things in your life that keep, keep your mind in a perpetual spin cycle? You could probably identify them by just simply noticing, paying attention to what immediately rises to the surface of your heart and mind when the noise fades away. Or for some of you, you're like, I don't ever let the noise fade away because I don't want to pay attention to my thoughts. That, that very thought is even frightening for you. That spin cycle, that distraction, guess what? It can also be created when we exchange our identity in Christ for a substitute identity marker. When we lose sight of the fact that we are loved by God and we start chasing after acceptance by God through our success or the admiration of those that we serve or, or the power of influence or being accepted or the, the using of all of our gifts. She's distracted. Secondly, she's also busy. It says that she's busy. Do you know that busyness is actually not a badge of honor? But we wear it like it's a virtue, don't we? I mean, think about how often. Think about how often when you have an exchange with someone and they're like, hey man, how are you doing? What are you up to? Man, I'm so busy. <laughs> like we're all supposed to high five each other. Man, I'm so glad that your life is so busy and distracted. Busyness, as we see in the story, distracts us from God. It distracts us from others. And it distracts us from that which is most important. The other thing that we see in Martha, sign of unhealth on the lower deck, is she's annoyed. Did you notice it? She's just flat out annoyed. She comes to Jesus directly and boldly. She is incredulous with Jesus. Can you, can you imagine talking to Jesus the way she's talking to Jesus? Don't you even care about me, Jesus? I'm serving alone. Oh, poor Martha. Whoa, it's Martha. Nobody's noticing all the good that I'm doing. All, I'm slaving away here in the kitchen. Don't you notice, Jesus? Do you, you see her annoyance with Jesus? She's annoyed with Jesus. Because she tells him, hey, you need to tell my sister who's being unfair, who's being selfish, who's being lazy sitting here at your feet while all these mouths have to be fed. Tell her to get off of her can and help me. But you know, annoyance is one of those signs that things aren't, things aren't healthy underneath. Have you ever, you ever had this encounter with a person who like, they didn't do anything really specific to annoy you, but everything they do annoys you, like to the point that you're like, I don't even like the way that you breathe. Can, can you breathe different? But just everything they do is an annoyance to you. Signs that there's a breach in the hole that's rising to the top level of your life. Distraction, busyness, annoyance. 
all of her activity, don't miss this, all of her activity has skewed her perspective of what it looks like to follow Jesus. She's saying, what does it look like to follow Jesus? Be busy doing stuff. That's what she thinks. And all of that is revealed by her attitude. Her attitude reveals that she is out of fellowship with Jesus. That there's just misalignment. That there is a, a breach in the hole on the, the, the lower level, and it's rising to the surface. And so how does Jesus respond to her? Look at verse 41. It says, The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Now, Jesus' response fits a pattern. If you were to pay attention to the New Testament, what you'll notice is, is that, that whenever someone asks Jesus to step in and resolve a dispute, he's usually slow to take the side of the person asking for help. When there's a dispute between people, Jesus is usually slow to take the side of the person asking for help. We'll explain why in just a little bit. But Jesus is tender rather than abrasive towards Martha. He's, Martha, Martha, he sees a woman overwhelmed with her stress. He sees a woman who is emotionally flooded by her circumstances. And in being flooded by her circumstances, she is running over and hurting other people around her with her attitude. Which is exactly what happens to all of us, right? When we're emotionally flooded, we, we end up hurting all the people around us. Whether we intend to or not, it still hurts. Everything happening in the lower deck is surfacing. And Jesus says, you're anxious and troubled. He, he identifies with that. I mean, he, he understands that she's focused on getting everything right for the visit. And, and, and he understands that she's disturbed by Mary's lack of help. It just reminds me, when I was a kid, my mom used to, my parents both worked, and she would, they would leave a list, like at certain times, especially in the summer, of things that we were supposed to do. And my younger sister would always get up before me and claim all of the chores that I wanted to do. And, but my focus was always on what she was doing versus what I was supposed to be doing. Man, that's, that's an easy ditch to fall into, isn't it? What others are supposed to be doing versus what we're supposed to do. I mean, if we're honest, all of the activity associated with following Jesus can prevent us from living a life that's really focused on Jesus. Here is Martha, active for the sake of the gospel, but she's not doing so from a posture of abiding love in Christ. And so Jesus rebukes her. Now, don't, don't misunderstand something. Jesus, Jesus is not underestimating the importance of service. As a matter of fact, he is later going to tell the disciples in Luke chapter 12, they need to be ready to serve. He's not rebuking Martha's actions. He is rebuking her actions at the expense of that which is necessary. He's not rebuking her actions of serving. He's rebuking her actions that are coming at the expense of that which is most important. I wonder, in your own life, what are the necessary things, what are the necessary things that you are neglecting in your life because you are busy and distracted with other things. Don't lose sight of what the necessary thing is. It's attentiveness to Jesus. It's abiding in the love of Christ. So what are the necessary things that you're neglecting in the midst of your busyness? And a lot of you, here's the thing, a lot of your busyness might be for the sake of the gospel. Jesus accepts Mary's posture. Why? Because he prefers fellowship to service. Hey, this might be a newsflash to you, but what Jesus wants more from you than anything else is relationship. Not your gifts, not the impact that someone with your great personality could have on the kingdom of God. He just wants you. He wants relationship. And the more, here's the thing, the more emotionally healthy and aware I become personally, the more conscious I am of how often I flee intimacy with Jesus, how often I hide from Jesus, how often I hide from people, and I hide behind, guess what? Serving. Because here's the thing, intimacy is scary, isn't it? We don't like feeling vulnerable. <laughs> 
Some of us may not even know how to slow down and be with Jesus. Like busyness for the sake of Jesus, the Martha posture is the only thing that we've ever known. But that's a dangerous life to live. Listen to what Henry Nguyen said. He said this, without solitude, which is just, an, just, just the, uh, solitude is the idea of slowing down to be with Jesus, right? Without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. So without slowing down to be with Jesus, it's virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside time to be with God and listen to Him. Communion, relationship, fellowship. What is Jesus' point? It's better to be a listening disciple than an immaculate host, right? That's what He's saying to us. You remember what that Tim Keller quote from last week when I said, about the, the lawyer who asked Jesus, what do I do to inherit eternal life? That the wrong question is asking, what do I do to get what I want? The right question is, what do I do to get Jesus? And the way that we get that is when we prioritize him as our portion, which is what Mary's doing. The way of Jesus, in his way, abiding is more important than doing. But here's the thing. When we abide, the doing just comes with it eventually, right? There's a sense of understanding the voice of Jesus and knowing what he wants us to do, and we participate in that, but not, not at the cost of abiding, which is why I said our big idea for the day. A purposeful life prioritizes abiding in the presence of Jesus over ministry to Jesus or ministry for Jesus. So here's the thing. We could stop the sermon right there. Like, if we just wanted to stop there and drill down an application, we could do it. And the application would be really clear. We need to spend more time listening to Jesus. We need to be attentive to Jesus. We need to seek a relationship with Him. We need to read the Bible more and pray more, not as a, another box to check on our to-do list, but because we want to know Him better. We want to know ourselves better. All of that would be a good and necessary reminder because my guess is we can all point to things that are getting in the way of that which is necessary in our life. We've all got a list of excuses of things that get in the way of communing with Jesus. So this would be a good reminder for us, right? Our life that's marked by busyness and vocation and ministry and leisure. The point that Jesus is making is none of those things should keep us from spending time with Jesus. And yet they do, because Tim Keller reminds us, they do because our nature is to focus on doing over being. That is our nature, to focus on doing over being. And so this encounter between Jesus and Martha and Mary represents a paradigm shift for us, right? And so Jesus is wanting us to pay attention to him, and in paying attention to him, here's what happens. As we pay attention to Jesus, we become more attuned to his grace at work within us. We become more attuned to growing in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we become less concerned about how our gifts are being used for the sake of the gospel. We become more aware of his grace in us and less concerned about always using our gifts. He said, I mean, he wants us to use those gifts, but that doesn't need to be our primary concern. And so the story says anything that comes at the expense of time with Jesus and his word is not a good choice, right? So again, what's crowding out your attentiveness to Jesus? What, what is crowding out and encroaching upon your intimate time with Jesus? Because here's the thing, the more personally, testimony, the more I slow down, the more I slow down, and spend time with Jesus, the more I sense and experience the presence of God, which that's what I want. Would it surprise you to know that I don't always experience the presence of God when I'm serving God? Do you? Do you always experience the presence of God in all of your serving? The answer is probably no. Why? Because oftentimes it, we're serving out of the wrong posture. We're not serving from the posture of abiding in Christ. And so life is short. We can't, 
We can't do everything. Am I, are we going to prioritize what matters the most? That, we could stop the sermon right there. But we're not going to because I think we need to have a sense of, I, I want you to see in a small way how, how that time, that communion with Jesus is transformative. Because again, it can still just be a box to check. Read the Bible, pray, check the box. You know, I spent 37 seconds with Jesus, or I spent three minutes and seven seconds with Jesus, or I spent 37 minutes with Jesus. You know, it's probably, I mean, like, we all try to squeeze him in, right? By the way, how do you feel about your relationships with the people you love when all they do is try to squeeze you in? You feel valued by them? I mean, I don't, right? Sometimes life just happens, and that, I mean, sometimes it just, there's, when I'm talking about when it's the norm, right? Does that make sense? So, again, the more I slow down to be with Jesus, the more growth I see in my life. The gift of sitting at Jesus' face, at, at Jesus' feet, means that I begin to see his grace within me. John Owen, who wrote a lot about communion with God, said that communion is not just about reading your Bible and praying, but communion is about abiding with God. It's about a relationship. It is about God revealing himself to us and speaking to us and us responding to him in joy. He says it is a joint participation. Sometimes when I'm spending time with Jesus, it feels like a one-sided conversation. Because I, I don't often know how to crowd out all the noise, you're right? To be there present at his feet. But the purpose of communion is that you might experience God, His love, His grace, to be changed by Him. And here's the thing. That's why Jesus doesn't side with Martha. He doesn't side with Martha because He is more interested in transforming her than He is appeasing her fairness doctrine. I'm doing all this work by myself. Jesus is more interested in transforming her. Which is why he doesn't side with her. And he wants the same thing for you and the same thing for me, right? Now, her busy life, now we're getting the part of transformation, her busy life reveals a besetting sin that I'm very familiar with. You might be familiar with it too, I don't know. But if you spend time with Jesus, here's what's going to happen. Guarantee, 100%. He's going to start revealing things to you about yourself that you don't like. Which is why some of us would rather do things for Jesus than spend time with him. Right? Because that's hard. It's hard to be confronted with things in your life that need to change. Does anyone like that? No. But you spend time with Jesus, that's what's going to happen. And as, as you spend time with him, the Spirit is going to start drawing to your attention your, your deepest besetting sins. In other words, what I mean is this. If you spend time with Jesus, that time will be less and less focused on sort of small, irregular occurrences of sin and more and more focused on those things in your life, those two to three to four to seven things in your life that regularly hold power over you. They derail you. They drag you down. A besetting sin is a sin that we continually struggle with or we have a weakness towards. A besetting sin is a sin we continually struggle with or have a weakness towards. John Piper calls it a reflex, meaning that we have this reflex in life to when something happens to us that's not premeditated but almost always either sinful or leads us to, to, to adopt a sinful posture. And communion with God enables us to begin with the Spirit's help to weaken the power of that sin. And here's how it does it. It does it because as we commune with God, as we look at Jesus, we begin to, we begin to look at, at different things. In other words, as I'm spending time with Jesus and he brings to mind my besetting sin, I start asking these kind of questions. In what way does Jesus have power over this sin? Or I start asking this question, in what way does Jesus what has in what way um, does what Jesus has done on the cross free me from the grip of this sin? Now here's what I want you to see. When I start asking questions about Jesus as I'm spending time with him, and I spend less time focusing on my sin. 
something transformative begins to happen. What happens in communion is that I'm looking at Jesus more than I'm looking at my sin. And as I do that, I begin to change. That's how you begin to change as well. Jesus, here's why we fear this. We fear it because on one level, when I look at Jesus in fellowship with him, I see a contrast between me and Jesus. I see Jesus who's everything that I'm not and who I can't be. And if I stop there, I feel small. I may not feel loved. I may feel guilt, shame. Because what? I see Jesus who's holy and I see myself as, as unholy, right? Does that make sense? But if I remember that Jesus isn't just the contrast between who God is and what I'm not, but he is also the remedy, I begin to change. Jesus is not just showing us what we aren't. Jesus is showing us what we are becoming as we put our faith in him. This is why Robert Murray McShane said, for every one look you take at your sin, take, take 10 looks at Jesus. That's the transformation. That's the journey. But it can only happen as we commune with God. If our approach to God is just to stay busy and the only time that we make eye contact with Jesus as if we are, in a, we are, walking, we are both walking down the street walking towards one another, we just catch a, gla a, a, a glance at Jesus. And maybe we do a double take, but we keep moving. We won't be transformed by that. We're transformed as we behold beauty. We're transformed as we remember that through the cross of Jesus, we live underneath the smile of God. Do you believe that? That when God, if you're in Jesus, when, G, when God looks at you, he delights in what he sees. No matter what kind of week you've had. Why? Because you're covered in the blood of Christ. You're covered in his righteousness. Jesus is exposing Martha's besetting sin with the invitation, come and have relationship with me. I want you more than I want your service. So what was that besetting sin? What's the besetting sin that I'm personally so familiar with? It's the sin of self-pity. Do you see it in verse 40? Jesus, do you not care? Do you not care? When she asks that question, she's doing, what, um, she's doing exactly what John Piper defines self-pity as. He says this, he says, Self-pity is the desire that others feel my woundedness and admire me for being so mistreated. Don't you see I'm serving alone, Jesus? Don't you care? Tell my sister to get up and do something. But something more is happening. She's, she's questioning more than the fairness of her sister. She's questioning God himself. Abigail Dodds points this out when she talks about self-pity. She says this, The sin in self-pity is that we assess ourselves and our circumstances as though God is not our gracious Father. You get what she's saying? When, I, when I'm feeling sorry for myself, I'm assessing it through this lens. God is not gracious and God does not love me. Abigail Dodds goes on. She says this, when we take God out of the picture, that's what self-pity does. Self-pity takes God out of the picture, puts us front and center. When we take God out of the picture, when, he's, when his pity for us in the death and resurrection of Jesus with the continued help of the Spirit isn't enough, we turn where? To ourselves for love and pity. I have a weakness towards self-pity. And rejection activates it. And especially when people I care about or admire reject me. And so what happens is, is I retreat. I isolate in that moment when it starts to settle in my soul. 
And but here's here's the danger of it. My mind and my heart begin to assume that because of that rejection, there is a gap in God's love for me. And in that gap, I look to find something to love me. Does that make sense? Too honest this morning? But that's what's happening. In that gap, my attention is turned inward, away from God's love. I tell myself, my circumstances are proof that God doesn't love me in this moment. Because my circumstances are different than I desire them to be. And so, in those gaps, I I cozy up to, to people or circumstances that are affirming. Now, You may not feel the danger of self-pity. You might say, man, this is just a story. It's not that big of a deal. I mean, like we can all understand with Martha. Self-pity is dangerous. I came across this quote that said it way better than I could say it about what the big deal is when we feel like the world is unfair. We draw attention to ourselves and we tell the world, hey, look look at me, I'm a martyr. My life is so hard and so unfair. Woe is me. And that's not to say there aren't hard things happening in your life, but the hard things in your life aren't necessarily a testimony that God doesn't love you. Here's what this quote said. I hope that you'll take it to heart. Self-pity is a dangerous, deceitful, heart-hardening sin. This quote grabbed my attention because I've found all three of those things to be true. Dangerous, deceitful, and heart-hardening. It is a spiritual deadener, choking faith, Draining hope, killing joy, smothering love, fueling anger, and robbing any desire to serve others. But the danger of it, I mean, that's, by the way, all of that is lower deck stuff. Self-pity is filling the lower deck with water to sink you, right? But he goes on to say this. And self-pity is a feeder sin, encouraging us to comfort ourselves with all manner of sinful indulgence, like gossip, slander, gluttony, substance abuse, pornography, binge entertainment, just to name a few. What is he saying? He's saying when we feel sorry for ourselves, we medicate ourselves, right? With something. It's what we do. We look for something to fill the gap that we think we're experiencing in God's love. I've told you that This is a sin I'm familiar with. Do you know what has weakened the power of that sin? Abiding in Jesus. That's what weakens the power of it. It's not, it hasn't been something that I do. It's abiding in Jesus. It's bathing myself in the reality that I am loved in Christ. It's living in the smile of God. It's setting Jesus before me like Mary. And when I do, he settles my heart. And he reminds me again that your circumstances are not a statement about my love for you. To quote Abigail Abigail Dodds one more time, she said, the problem of self-pity is a problem of sight. (laughs) And we see that in this story, don't we? Mary is seated at the feet of Jesus. So what do you think she's seeing? Jesus. And Martha is annoyed and distracted and busy in the kitchen. And she might as well be standing in front of a mirror because she can't see Jesus at all. She looks for attention Jesus could have given her the attention that she wanted and pat her on the back and said, you're doing a great job, Martha. You're right. I agree with you. Mary's a loser. But he doesn't do that. Why? He doesn't do it because Martha's gaze is on herself and her wounds. And he understands that she's not going to be healed by staring at her wounds or herself. She can only be healed by his wounds, by focusing on him. She was never going to be healed by her activity for God. And guess what? You won't be either. You'll never be healed by activity for God. 
It's only through abiding in the love of Christ. And so if you're here today, and we, as we close, if you're here today, if you want God to do something new in you, have you figured out where the starting point is? It's not by doing more. It's by abiding in the love of Jesus. It is, again, a reminder of our big idea. A purposeful life prioritizes. The good portion is what? Abiding in the presence of Jesus more than doing for Jesus. And maybe you're here and you're, ab- you're uncertain of what abiding looks like. You're just kind of like, I, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus. And so maybe your next step is just to begin to pray, God, will you bring someone into my life who can help me take that journey of what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus? Like not just doing religious stuff, but having a relationship with him. And on the flip side of that, maybe you're here and you've been walking with Jesus for a long time. You say, man, Aaron, my my life with Jesus has never been sweeter than it is right now. And maybe what you need to begin to pray is, Jesus, who can I invest in to help them take those steps to get to where I am today? Not because of what you've done. That's a work of the Spirit of God. But there are things that God used other than the Holy Spirit for you to go deeper in your walk with Jesus, right? Right? And those are things that you can share with someone else. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word that you've given us today. We thank you um, that we, we, here's this encounter that we all can identify with so well. Whether we have a Mary posture or a Martha posture or we're somewhere in the middle, the reality of our lives is this, Lord, there are so many things that squeeze out that which is necessary. Lord, would you forgive us? Would you forgive us of losing sight of that which matters the most? Would you forgive us of um, accepting the low-hanging fruit of of busyness for God over the life-giving relationship that you want with us? And Lord, all across the room as we sing this next song, these next couple of songs, Lord, we... We ask that, Lord, as we sing, that we would also adopt a posture of prayer, that we would cry out to you in the ways that we need to change, in the ways that we are missing what you've called us to, the ways that maybe we've exchanged our identity. Maybe there are people here today who think their only value in life is as an athlete or as someone who gets good grades or someone who makes a certain amount of money or is someone who always says or does the right thing or someone who can get it done. Lord, we all are tempted by that identity exchange. and Lord, I pray that you would shower those who are struggling with that with your love and presence in this time of response. For the one who's here that's not following you, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would draw them to Jesus through faith in Christ right now in this moment. If you're here, you're not a lover of God, a follower of Jesus, you want to place your faith in Jesus. Cry out to him in this moment. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Jesus, I want a relationship with you. Change me from the inside out. And if that's you today, I encourage you to tell someone who seated around you, come talk to me. But give your life to Jesus today. And for those all over this room who maybe who need discipled or would love to disciple, Lord, would you begin making connections, begin orchestrating events to put people in place. They might make connections. They might experience you, your heart, your love for them. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Will you stand with me as we sing this song, remembering that whatever new work that Jesus wants to do in us requires new wineskins? and that you'd be willing to take that journey with him, ask him to do something new in you today.